Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Now in this video, I have a very special guest. I've got Giovanni from High Integrity Skills, and we'll be talking about our experiences as Asian men dating in Western culture or Western society. We'll also be sharing with you some top tips on how you can optimize your appearance, your style in order to improve your date life, your social life, your general life. So stick around because you're not gonna wanna miss this. I just thought I'd reach out to you, Giovanni. You're the, the Asian dating guru guy. You know, my channel is obviously about lifestyle and a bit of fitness and music. I guess dating comes under that. Do you want to kind of tell my channel a little bit about yourself? Yeah, Maticus, thanks for the intro. Well, I don't know if I'm like the only Asian dating coach. There are actually a lot of them out there. They're just not that well known. None of us are well that well known, actually. I, I don't even, I'm not even that well known. So there are a lot of Asian dating coaches and there are a lot of dating coaches and then there are a lot of like women dating coaches. So there are a lot of dating coaches. Um, a lot of them, there's like half of them that are like very, very like red pill. And then there's like the other half that are like, you know, look, only looks matter. And then I'm kind of in the periphery because I'm not that big yet where people would like attack me directly. But eventually that might happen depending on where it goes. I, I've made it a point in my channel to just not talk about other coaches. Like I'm focused on the subject itself. You've talked about it in some of your videos, but there's been sort of a shift to kind of online dating, which I definitely feel is a little more superficial. Most likely it has made dating more about appearance. And I know you talked a little bit about some of the other dating coaches being more red pill and some of them being black pill. So I feel like it's more first impressions online, especially than it ever was before. So before you do anything, there has to be a decision in your mind. Like I want to improve the way that the world perceives me. Because once you make that decision, then it becomes, I can control how people react to me based on the way I look, I, at least in the beginning of my interactions, you see. And that's the first step. And unfortunately, a lot of guys don't even reach that first step. And a lot of guys have the fallacy like, she's going to like me for me, or she's superficial, or she's gonna, if he, she's going to judge me for how I look or how I dress. And that is a form of, in my opinion, mental laziness as well. Because the reality is you judge other people on how they look too. Everyone does at least in the beginning. First impressions are important, at least in the beginning. That's just a fact of life. So you have to make a decision and say, look, I'm gonna, I wanna control how people perceive me, how people perceive me, rather than just leaving it up to chance. So that's the first step. Unless someone takes that first step, I'm not even gonna help them because what happens is you end up telling your friends they look bad or <laughs> you give them suggestions and they just look at you weird. It's like, it's unnecessary social conflict. Same thing with dating. It's like, oh, she's going to like me for me. And I'm looking at this guy and all the girls are like rolling their eyes. I'm like, dude, you, you need to, <laughs> things have to change for, for you for things to happen. The second step is for most guys, you can go head to toe. That's one method. Another method is to copy someone that looks like you and on, on, go on Pinterest and find like different styles you can kind of emulate and find out how do I emulate this. Find your phenotype basically, that's what they say, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Find an uh, analogy <laughs> in terms of like your image or we call them lookbooks. So find a lookbook that suits you. But even before that, most guys don't even need to go that, that hard, like depending on where the client is. Most of the time it's like, dude, your, your clothes don't, don't fit, right? Fit is the most important thing. Um, you're, you're, you're matching like a jean jacket with like khakis, like it doesn't work, right? There's a matching problem or like there's a color problem, like your whole closet looks like very like gray, you know? There's no color to your, to your palette. Um, so these are things that you can see client by client, okay? There, so, some clients work, um, that's the key about being, like I'm learning how to be a coach. It's like different people respond differently to different learning methods. So for you, for example, I could say, look, Maticus, go from your hairstyle, start, you know, hair, eyebrows, nose, you know, any kind of foundation you can put that wouldn't look too feminine, your lip gloss, you know, or keeping your lips um, not chapped, right, dry, all the way down from head to toe. You can analyze every single little thing, but that's not necessary for a lot of guys. For a lot of guys, it's just clean, you know, well, shower, <laughs> be well-groomed, yeah. find clothes that fit, have a basic um, um, style or outfit that you liked of someone that kind of looks like you, has your height or your face structure, Go on Pinterest. I always use Pinterest. I think Pinterest is like 90% women. So most guys don't use it, but for style, it helps. And then just try to emulate that style. Try to break it down. What's that hairstyle? You know, what, what product is he using to, to get that? What, um, what are the clothing pieces? Is this a V-neck? Is this a, you know, is it a jacket yeah. over a V-neck? Or is it like, are these jeans? And then in Pinterest, the cool thing is that you can even tag, some people tag the brands that they're using, right? Or if you go to like a lookbook website, there are a lot of them out there. 
they tag like you can go directly to to the site. When you go to the site, or if you go online, um, sometimes you can get a really good deal. But the problem is you can't feel it, so you don't know if it always fits. And so sometimes you gotta send it back. Whereas going to a store will train your eye to like understand texture and how th- that though that size, like a medium size, like a gap is different than like a medium, I guess, right? So how those sizes fit you. So all those things encompass style, right? But I'm getting into like the details of how to implement. But going back to the original, it's just making that decision. And then just fixing the major glaring mistakes that just automatically girls just rule you out, right? Like smelling bad, you know, white socks, like not matching uh, white socks with like leather shoes, unless you're Michael Jackson, right? Um, and just like uh, like color, complete color, you know, discoordination, the unibrow, right? The very common mistakes or like yeah. a really bad like um, acne scars, which is not your fault. That there's things you can do there for sure. Um, really like yellow teeth, uh, like jacked up teeth that kind of those are these are what we call like automatic outs like the moment she sees you you're out of the dating game like it's over right i mean if you're going for a girl in my opinion with the marketplace value that's above seven it's like you're out like you're not even competing anymore what do you think of clean shaven versus stubble versus beard because obviously for me as an asian fella I've never been able to grow beards. My opinion on facial hair is my is the same as my philosophy on style, which is do the minimum possible for the maximum amount of attraction points. Like, what's the minimum amount of effort to get maximum result in dating? I just do what's the minimum required for the social event. Like, I'm not in that. I've worked in modeling. I've been in that fashion industry, but I'm not like. I'm not competing with like you know new fashion terms with like people at the last modeling you know fashion show whatever fashion season so that's not my goal my goal if you listen to my advice it's minimum effort for maximum gains so maintaining a beard is difficult for most guys right even the the full grown ones you need beard oil you have to like trim it so for me it's like a lot of work to maintain beard so most of the time i would say unless you it naturally grows it's almost not worth it just shave it you're fine you're better off, better off, better off shaving it some guys get like hair implants for beards. But for Asian guys, I would say most of the time, because of stereotypes, beards don't generally tend to look good on us. I think we look better clean shaven. I know there's a YouTuber, he's called Austin Dunham and he's, he's quite a big channel. And he's been using like minoxidil to grow a beard, the hair growth sort of serum. So even topical minoxidil has side effects for some people. So like, you're, you're, like you gotta ask, like, at what cost am I? Oh, I wanna get a nose job, great, what's the risk? I could you know have trouble breathing, shit. <laughs> I want to grow taller, but I might not be able to walk. Like, if you had, like, a magic <laughs> lamp, and he, he's like, would you make this trade? But like, uh, you know, most people would say no, right? But if you're so desperate, you're like, I want to make this trade. But you got to think about the, the ROI. Most, for most guys, if you just fix the basic stuff with your style, have a basic style that looks above, slightly above average compared to all the white guys in khakis and, you know, like, plaid shirts, right? <laughs> like, go to the bar in the States, that's what they all look like then that the rest of the gap in this, the two points from seven to nine, I'm talking about sexual marketplace value on average, right? You can make up with like good gain. So you don't need to like be a nine. For a guy, you don't need to be like a hot nine. You can be a seven and still get a 10. <laughs> but I mean, look, if you're a five, yeah, you need to close that gap, right? To at least a seven. But if you're a seven, which most guys are, if they take care of themselves, you can get a nine or 10 if you have gain to cover the gap. I do think that in the beginning, if you never thought about this, just being aware of like how you look, it can be a changing um, experience. It's a very transformative experience. Like, oh, I can control how I look. I can, when I look in the mirror, I feel good. And I can, wow, I'm getting these reactions. If I dress a certain way, if I, if I wear you know, this tie and the suit that fits, uh, I find that people respect me more on job interviews. You know, um, I can dress down and go to a friend's casual event and still look good enough where if I see a girl walk by, I can go say hi and, you know, it would work for me. So you can start controlling uh, how the world reacts to you. And that's a very powerful feeling because you're starting to take back control as opposed to letting things happen randomly, right, which most guys do. So having style, having the discipline to say I can control my visual appearance to the world is a form of uh, power through the control of style. That, that you can get different reactions. The paradox of this is that, um, and I fell into this trap when I was modeling too, because when you're modeling, everyone's like, oh, you got this be- you know, dot here, your nose is a little bit too big. It's like, well, every day you hear that. So 
after a while, it starts becoming your life, and it's like, no, this is something you take care of. And then if you're sick, if I'm sick and I'm going to the to the store to buy food, am I really gonna care about what I'm wearing? <laughs> no, I don't give a right. So you have to let like, let that go, right? The skill set's supposed to help you enrich your life. Then you learn it, and then you stop thinking about it once it becomes automatic. Most guys don't even have the basics, so just getting the basics down is will take probably a few months, and then once they have it down, you'll have it for the rest of your life. Prior to like this year, so I'm 27 now, but prior to this year, I would think that dressing in a hoodie and trackies all the time was appropriate. My mentality was that if I'm comfortable, you know, I don't care really what I look like. I had a mop hairstyle. I literally had acne from 16 until 26. And essentially what happened was I started online dating and I had a lot more success than I anticipated. And I think from there, that was a confidence booster to then I was like, I'm going to take more care of my appearance. I'm going to, I can dress better. Your experience is pretty unique because most guys go online dating and it doesn't work for them. And then they're like, what can I do to fix that? So probably because you're naturally already, Wheat Waffles would call it like a, a Chad, low Chad, based on his scale. Yeah. So, so then you, you would get results without knowing what to do or maybe you do know a little bit about what to do. That's, that's good. That's different than most, most, most of my clients' experiences. A leather jacket's kind of like a... It's almost like a suit of armor, right? Without, like, you can wear the suit, but the suit is also very, like, this guy dr really tried. You know, he's really, like, dressing up, unless that's your normal, like, everyday attire. Unless you're in New York or you're working in finance, you don't really need a suit every day, right? But a leather jacket, you can just throw on. And it, it just adds a level of dominance that a lot of, um, I would say, Asians, but also guys that don't have a lot of dominance naturally um, can gain dominance with just one item which is pretty, pretty efficient, in my opinion. I, I don't have a particular style for Asian guys. I mean, it depends where you are. I think also, like, style for Asian guys in Asia is different than style for Asian guys in the States. So for me, like, I was living in San Diego. Like, I'm competing against, like, military dudes, you know? Like, so I had to, you know, add dominance. I did that for a few years. But if you're in New York, it's more, you can be metrosexual and still, still get girls, right? I know back in the 80s, guys were dressed very feminine, and they got girls. Whereas like in the 90s, it was more like about like you know Arnold Schwarzenegger and Slow Rossa Stallone, and so it just depends on the on the trends. Every guy has to have a basic level of visual dominance to create that initial spark, okay? And then your communication skills come after that. There's a level of unspoken, I'm a man, and there's different ways. How do I become a man, Giovanni? Well, there's different ways to do that, technique-wise, visually, and also communication. How do you go about like a cold approach? Let's, let's play a thought experiment. Okay, let's just take a city I used to live in. Uh, let's say you're living in uh, San Diego, right? And uh, San Diego has, when I was living there, it was 1.3 million. It's a population. So it's an okay city. It's not that big, right? Just com for comparison, Bay Area has about 7 million people. New York metropolitan area has about 9 million and growing. Miami is about 600,000, right? So San Diego is a small town. And then if you do a cold approach in San Diego, um, as an Asian guy, first of all, 90% of the population there, you're going to meet girls that are like 90% are white, American. So your cold approach game has to be pretty strong there to get results, right? And you have to go through a lot of numbers. The nice thing about American culture, though, is that girls won't reject you right away, especially now given the PC climate. They don't want to seem racist. So they'll talk to you, but the problem is when you cold approach them, you don't know, like, sometimes they just won't date Asian guys. So you have to screen that out very quickly. Online dating in San Diego is not that good as an Asian guy because online dating is more superficial, right? So you have to be swiping a lot. Um, but if you do the numbers, you can get some dates. I have found that because in smaller cities or mid medium-tier cities, my cold approach, I'm able to attract girls that are higher quality cold approaching than I am with online dating. My online dating quality is always lower than the cold approach quality by about two points, 1.5 to two points, consistently. The other part we did in San Diego was we had a warm social circle, and that was very easy. The problem with the social circle is that our social circle is very superficial, so it's all like club girls, and they're fun to hang out with for a few times, but then they get really annoying. So... <laughs> so that's a warm approach. Now, now, a lot of time, effort, even financial investments went into that to build that circle. Um, and it can be worthwhile if that's your goal in your 20s and you just want to party. But it's, it's definitely like an investment, right, for sure. Now, that's San Diego. Now, let's take New York City, okay, or Boston where I went to school. Let's take New York City because it's more, uh, more people and uh, it's a lot more. Like, Boston's a very unique city. Okay, so New York City... 
you can code approach and you can meet models, right? Like only in, like what other city can you just meet models like every other block? Probably won't one or two cities in the world. New York is one of them. Um, you'll never run out of girls to talk to, right? So cold approaching New York, you can actually get tens, right? If you're just like, like even a seven, you, if you consistently cold approach and you know what you're doing, you can get a 10 girlfriend. Online dating is really good in New York because the ratio is in your favor, right? There are more single women in New York than uh, any other city in the U.S. compared to single males, okay? So online dating, I know clients who don't think they're that good looking, they get results once they move to New York. Then warm approaching New York is interesting because New York is so big and so eclectic that it just depends on which circle you're in. If you're the leader of the chess club, <laughs> you're probably not going to meet a lot of girls. But if you're like organizing, you know, um, brunches or if you're organizing uh, uh, yoga Pilates class right, or board game night and you happen to buy a lot of girls and you're the main guy, once you build that warm circle, it it's, can be very lucrative, right? Um, so those are, that's the comparison between all three. For me, cold approach, once you know what to do, it's just a form of freedom. Three of my girlfriends, three out of four of my girlfriends I met through cold approaches. Because I can see a girl I like, and I'll be like, look, she looks good. I'm going to go talk to her. And you never know. Now, cold approaching, even for me, even if you're like, a, I'm not, oh, Brad Pitt's famous, but if you look like Brad Pitt and you weren't famous, you can code approach and still get rejected because some girls just will not talk to you. Like she has a boyfriend, she's having a bad day, you know, she's got her earphones on. It doesn't matter how good looking you are, she's just not gonna talk to anybody, right? You ever like on your phone, you're just trying to get somewhere and like someone interrupts you and you're like, hey, I was gonna donate to you like some other day, but I'm just really busy today, I'm just not gonna talk to you. You don't know if her mother just died, you don't know if her pet was got sick, like you have no clue, it's just, it's cold, it's random. So you cannot take code approach personally. But when you're standing there in person and she's like, <sighs> you know, it just gives you like, I was like, don't talk to me, talk to the head. Like some really harsh rejections. That first se second time, you just say, ah, oh. it's like riding a bike and I, I, got a, I hit a bump. Let me warm up a little bit. After about three or four, that's when I get into momentum where I'm like, oh, these rejections don't really matter. They don't know me. I don't know them. It's not about who I am. But I know that logically, but emotionally, my heart's trying to catch up. So now I'm caught up. Okay, so after the third or fourth approach, I, nothing really sauce me anymore at this point in my training. So then I just go like talk to girls I find attractive. And in a, any big city, whether you're in Taipei, Bangkok, New York, London, there's enough social velocity that if you talk to three or four girls, right, if you wait 10 minutes, the traffic's changed, and now it's a whole group of people. So you can practice over and over again, assuming you're not being a total creep, and get a lot of experience or get a lot of chances to play this game over and over again. And the nice thing about New York is that you can play that game at the highest level possible. Okay. Now, if you look like a scrub and you're talking to models, probably, probably they're not going to give you the time of day, right? unless your game is really, really good. Um, but if you look good and you have game, the, the, you know, the, the, there's no limit in New York as far as what you can do. Sometimes after the cold approach, you get a number and, the, and then it's like, what's my messaging game like? Or like, you know, if you, if you live with your mom's basement, yeah, that's going to be a problem. Then as she gets to know you, that becomes like a lifestyle issue, right? Like a top model in New York is not going to necessarily hang out with you every day if you're living, you know, in a, on a bunk bed with your roommate, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so in a small apartment. Um, so those things come into play. So I would say everyone, like, get to a point where you're stable, financially stable. You don't have a lot of, like, drama in your life. Most guys in their 20s and 30s and even 40s and 50s, as long as your life is stable to some degree, if you acquire the cold approach skill set, you can, especially even in a medium city, ideally a, a bigger city, you can have dating freedom. If you know how to code approach, there's always freedom in your life. Unless you live in a super small town where there's not enough social velocity. If you do online dating, the nice thing is there's a big geography. And you can, if you're in a small town, you can, you know, set your zip code to the next uh, closest city and just do it that way. If you warm approaching, you got to invest. And we can talk about how to do that successfully, but it requires a large time, often financial and emotional investment in making friends and building that circle. All three can work for you depending on your circumstances. For me personally, I think cold approach is the most freeing because you can go anywhere in the world and you can do it. You can do it. As long as you speak the language, you can have dating freedom. Online dating, yes, you can go anywhere in the world, but I've, I, I have never, 
I don't know, maybe white guys have a different experience, although I don't think so because some of them are clients and my friends, but there's always a gap. Cold approach, online dating, higher quality. Probably because online dating girls, hot girls get uh, 10 times the number of messages. So they have a lot of options. And you're, when you're in front of her, she can't ignore you. It's like, this is who I am, right? So I have found in the last 10 years of my life that my cold approach quality, as far as like just what I can visually see, of course, over time you get to know the person, but quality with a cold approach is always 1.5 to 2 points higher than what I would get from online dating, no matter how much I swipe. Do you know what's really interesting? You talked about what would kind of online dating be like for a white guy. Now I might get into trouble for this, for admitting this online, but I actually wanted to know the same thing. So I decided to do a little experiment where I, so I took a male model. So he was a very good looking bloke, six foot three male model. Didn't, didn't put that in the bio, obviously, put that he was in London. And I did it for a week, got like a couple likes a day. His match rate was, maybe like two or three at most, Norm, sometimes one out of eight. He didn't do that much better than me. And I was a little bit shocked because I thought there was going to be a huge gap. There have been times when I've, as an Asian guy, um, you know, if the girl rejects me, it's because she don't like Asians um, or whatever. <laughs> that's that's my, my cope, if you like. <laughs> the other thing that was very, very interesting, but there were two girls that I matched with on my profile that replied to a few of my messages and then just ghosted me, right? And these girls did exactly the same thing to this male model. So that made me feel a bit better about myself. It was pretty obvious that these girls were not really looking for anything serious or that they have really, really high standards. Like how can you have higher standards than a male model who's like an eight plus out of 10? Doesn't make any sense. Anyway, I thought I'd just add that in because I don't think I was super clear. And you always think of things that you could say after you've had a chat with someone, don't you? So here's my opportunity and I've taken it. Yes, bigger cities like New York and L.A., I don't even notice that I'm Asian sometimes. I forget. But in San Diego, I distinctly, you can see that look in their, her eyes when she's just like, you know, it's like she's, you're seeing an alien, but he looks ugly. But when, you, when I go to Brazil, you can, oh, they see an alien, but it looks like a nice peacock. It's very beautiful. So it's a different look. And you can tell it by the, the, you know, the, the look in their eye. It's kind of like a look of wonder versus a look of like foreignness, weird, you know. And, and that happens in the States, especially in San Diego. San Diego has some beautiful blondes, by the way, and I dated some of them, but it, it was not the easiest. It was easier than the Bay Area, for sure, because by then I acquired some skills when I moved, but it, it was not the easiest place to date. The moment I moved to L.A., and whenever I go to New York, it's better. As far as the model thing, so I have two things to say about that. One is I also did an experiment. This was 10 years ago, but it was also an online dating experiment. We had a regular, we call regular white guy, regular, regular Asian guy, and we had a model white guy and a model Asian guy. What do you think the results were? Well, funny you should say that because Nero Angelo, he did Asian supermodel, Caucasian supermodel, 5,000 swipes. The white fella got 300 matches. And then the Asian supermodel, who was Godfrey Gao, the first Asian supermodel, very good looking guy, only got, I think he got 100, I think less than 100, but the, the results were ridiculous. And then when they repeated it for a Asian guy, and a white guy, just a regular, I guess they were both still pretty good looking. Godfrey Gao barely did better. He, in fact, he didn't do better than the slightly better than average looking white guy, which was actually crazy. And I just, I suspect that was the same for your experiment as well. My experiment results were different. That's very interesting. So, well, I did it 10 years ago, so it was a little bit longer ago, but also, yeah. When you, when, like, you have to look at the details of the experiment. So when we swiped, we waited a week straight after the swipes for the likes to come in. Because sometimes, they, like a lot of, they accumulate over time. So we found that, obviously, the models did better. The white model did better than the Asian model, but it was by, like, not, not by a lot. It was by, like, I think 30 to 50% number of likes. However, um... Uh, the white model got a lot more, not a lot more, like nine or 10 messages, whereas the Asian model got like three or four messages. Then the regular guy and the regular Asian guy, they were both, they, they both didn't do that well. And the regular guy only did like, not that much better. It was like five or 10% better. So that, that, those are the results I got 10 years ago. Um, what I found from that result was that if you are at the top end of the spectrum, the results can tend to go exponential a little bit for guys, right? But for girls, it's like this. For guys, it's kind of like this. So 
Um, however, when you're really good looking, be white or Asian, the difference, we didn't find a different stat extreme at that end. So for me at that time, it was just like, mess- how do you message girls? So that's interesting. I would like to see how he did his experiment. I'm really curious. I don't want to get canceled. So someone else said this. <laughs> if you reach a certain point where you're like super good looking or like everyone sees you and right away that reaction is hot, then it doesn't matter what race you are. You see, because you already, you already passed tip that barrier, the tipping point where people are just like, this person's hot. So there's that game. Then there's a game where if you're not hot or if you're not able to get to that point, can you at least be presentable? I will tell you this still. I have guys who look like male models get on coaching calls with me, and I'm like, so what can I help you with? And you'll be surprised. I I had a guy who was um, European, blonde hair, blue eyes, super good looking, and See, his problem is very different, right? And you would think that most guys hear that and they're like, oh, this guy, like they start getting a little bit of that envy, jealousy, you know, in their, in their hearts. But I can tell you, like, he, it's actually, his problem is quite difficult, you know? He has girls coming up to him at the club. And he says, Giovanni, after they talk to me for, for like five minutes, they walk away. And he's like, you don't know what that does to me. It's like, I feel like, I'm, like they're coming to me for my looks, but they're not staying there because of my personality. And that makes me feel like shit because it's like, they're, they're rejecting me based on who I am rather than how yeah. I look, you know? Um, he'll tell me he gets matches online, but he'll message them and it never goes anywhere. So he, he's like, I can see the candy right there, but I can't, I can't taste it. It's like, there's a window and I, it's, I feel trapped, you know? And... That's even almost, in some ways, that's worse than a guy who can't get anything. Because the guy who, guy who can't get anything, the moment he gets things right, he starts seeing results. But this guy, he's seeing some results, but he doesn't know where he's going wrong. Because he's good looking, he has a high margin of error, which means he can do a lot of different things. And the girls that won't give him the right feedback as exactly what he needs to change, right? The good, and then, so there's pros and cons to both. And then once he corrects those, right, once he corrects them, then he starts getting results pretty quickly once he knows what sequence of things to correct. So it's not always the best looking guy gets the best results. They just come with different problems. They come with different problems. And I can tell you this as a former, uh, I've worked with a lot of different models. It's a, it's a blessing and a curse because as, you, as I'm aging now, it's like, oh, people like give me stuff or treat me well because of my looks. And that's very, very dangerous because your looks will fade. And it's like, what if this is my insurance? What if I get a scar, I get punched or something happens, I, I get older. It's a very weird feeling. So, and then what if everyone treats you one way because of how you look? And then like, what if I look like, you're constantly worried like, what, my relationships aren't real. You know, it's like none of this is real. They're just, they're just reacting to how I look. And that's a weird feeling to have. Now, if you're ugly uh, and you have friends, those are your real friends. <laughs> game is really important. The, the ability to talk, having a mouthpiece, knowing what to say, how to say it congruently, how to say it authentically. Over time, people start falling for you, your, your ability to express yourself. That's very powerful, and most guys don't realize that. Most black pill guys like wheat waffles, although I, I like the guy. I like listen, watching his videos, and I like him. Um, I don't think they've ever experienced that, or they maybe are not open to that. They don't realize how powerful communication is. And so they kind of discount that whole area, which is like the whole other 50%, right? 50% in the beginning. In the beginning, is 50-50, looks, communication. But as time goes by, for women, your behavior patterns become like 90%. And that's why you see these guys marry these really hot girls. It's because these guys have strong communication. Like Robert Kiyosaki, for example. They know how to communicate really well. And over time, women start falling for them, okay? So it's very powerful, especially over time. It grows. Uh, it's an investment. This person is advancing. He's communicating clearly. I feel more attracted to him. It's so much more powerful than just like the first impression. And most guys get stuck in the first impression because they never know how that journey goes later on. So they're complaining. Black pill, looks and money only matter because I'm here and I've never been here before. Huh? It's like, dude, you don't even understand, man. So look, I, I, I used to... Uh, I understand, you know, I used to be a hater too, but I, I, I don't, I didn't say a hater. The guys who say haters like five, 10 years down the road, then, then I start judging them a little bit. But I used to be a hater too. I hung out with a guy named Troy. He was a short Asian guy and I saw him live. He was a mentor of mine. Attract stunning women. Girls will stop on the street to talk to him because he has such this vibe, this energy field that he would literally, people would stop to talk to him. It wasn't just how he looked. He, he could control 
I can't explain it. He had a reality distortion feel like Steve Jobs. He can control the energy around him. And people will stop and talk to him and just like vibe with him. And I saw that and I'm like, okay, this is for real. Right. So then, and then I saw a couple other guys, not all Asians, some white guys. And I'm like, these guys aren't good looking at all, but they're pulling girls. And, and at first I went out at night. I was like, oh, cause the girls are drunk. And then I, I started hanging out with these guys who did day game. And I'm like, they're pulling really cute girls during the day. So all these limiting beliefs started going away once I started seeing what was going on. You know, back when I learned this, there wasn't a lot of like, uh, social media or YouTube. So you don't capture this on camera phones, but I saw it for real and I started, I started seeing that reality and then I was like, okay, game really matters, right? But I also realized that without the style, you have to put in a lot of work for the game and you need, and you need time. So that's the one constraint. If you, don't put in, if you don't have the style down, you need an environment. Like I had a guy who, um, <laughs> he has an Airbnb where he only uh, accepts listings, uh, bookings from hot European girls. <laughs> so, and he lives in New York. So... He's not the best looking guy, but he says, look, you just give me one night with him, one dinner, I'm good, you know? So, so, so if you don't have the style down, your initial image, then if you can somehow create an environment where there's time as you to your advantage and you have game, like Casanova, for example, notoriously ugly if you look at his portraits, right? But he knew how to talk to people. So if you have time, you can, you can convince them, you can influence them to start liking you. Very few guys know how to do that. Even I'm not that good at that. I just learned from the best, you know? I've seen that happen over and over again. So I'm like, okay, look, most people watching this, like they want to get better. Look, wherever you are now, let's say you're five, right? If you improve your style, if you maximize your style points, right? With a minimum amount of effort, you can improve your point by two points on the marketplace. So from a five, you can get to a seven. I think most 90% of guys can get to a seven with like proper style. That includes like losing weight, fixing your teeth, all the long-term stuff too. But short-term, you can get to a seven. Um, and long-term, you can probably get to an eight. Then from there, the other two points you want to close is communication skills, right? Now, obviously, when I'm saying strong communication, I'm saying you maximize both. And to maximize both is not going to happen overnight. But if you can, that adds four points. So even if you're born a four, you can date an eight if you know what you're doing, okay? But most guys complain, oh, it's look, some money, rah, I'm going to stay here. And they stay here, and they accept what life gives them. And I see that over and over again. And some guys are okay with it, but for me, I wasn't. And so I'm, my, my job is to help people that are not okay with that to achieve the results. So that's been my mission, and I probably will do that for another year, and I'll probably retire because I don't want to be a dating coach when I'm 45 or 50. If you're a good-looking guy, things don't happen for you. You still have to make things happen. You still have to go know how to hunt. But if you're a good-looking girl, things happen to you. Guys come up to you. You get offers. So as a good-looking girl, you're going to get experience no matter what. And you, you'll start understanding how guys are, right? Or just by the time you're 23. However, for a good-looking girl to say, look, I'm good-looking, but I know this is just like one dimension. I'm going to actually go study for my master's or whatever. That's a very hard thing to do. But as a guy, even as a male model looking guy, if you do nothing, nothing will happen to you. So you still have to go out there and you still have to make things happen. And as a good-looking guy, sometimes you get hate from other guys just because you're good-looking. I'm not speaking from personal experience. Actually, I am speaking from personal experience as the ugly guy. So uh, I, was, <laughs> I was, used to be a hater. There's an email on my email list where I, I said I used to be a hater. So I would, used to look at these good-looking guys and I really hate them because I wasn't getting the results I wanted. And I'm like, this guy has it so good. Damn. And I got really mad, you know. One time I, I had a, I was with my brother, I remember, having dinner with him. And this really good-looking waiter was helping us. And... I just felt so bitter at that. This is a long time ago. I was so bitter that I didn't tip him that night. And I always regretted it. I was such a... Because I'm like, this guy's good looking. He's got everything life has to offer. Bro, let's not tip him. And I just dragged my brother and we left. We paid for the bill, but I put zero for the tip. And then um, later on, I felt a little bit of shame because I was like, that was pretty... You know, I can't I judge a book by its cover, right? But I think it wasn't about him. It was at that point, I had so many failures with women that I just became so bitter that he became like my next victim. Like it was like just boiling up, you know, and I just had to release it somehow. And he was the recipient of that just because he was good looking. Um, so that's interesting, right? So I think sometimes being looking is a curse too. Wherever you are, ultimately, if guys don't know how to 
get what they want in terms of dating, whether it's sex or just the love and their intimacy, things start piling up inside and they can turn dark if it doesn't get released. Okay, we have these trapped emotions that happen. And in the extreme, you see shootouts or very extreme examples of letting that anger out, right? But most people aren't that extreme. So what happens is you see the minor pollution of that um, emotion getting trapped, like passive aggressive bosses or men kind of just like making snide remarks on women or treating women badly because deep down they're actually like resentful of all the unsuccessful attempts they've had at, you know, getting what they want in their love life. So I think the black pill actually is a result of that. These guys haven't received the acceptance and the love that they craved. And so therefore, it's really easy to point the finger and say it's because you're sub five or because you don't have any money and women just care about these things, right? Did, did your mom care about these things when she was raising you? Solving this problem and letting people realize like, look, just, just care about your looks a little bit to the point where it's acceptable in the market. Understand the market, accept the market as reality, okay? It's not that bad. Then like work on your communication, right? Being able to communicate and speak clearly. Most guys don't know how to get to that real conversation, man. It's like, and I've coached hundreds of clients at this point. It's, it's pretty bad. Um, hey, how are you? Good. How's it going? So like, uh, how do you like your job? What do you do? Oh, cool. So like, like, do you like, do you like your job? Is it nice? So like, um, so what are your hobbies? You know? Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, uh, sorry, I'm blanking out. Um, uh, where are you from again? <laughs> and at, at best, they're a little bit smoother, but the questions are the same. Okay, so you're talking around the topic, but you're not really talking about the real topic. The real topic is, do you like what you do? Or did you kind of fall into it and now it's you're doing it because it's a routine paycheck and it's nice? Now, that's not the... F- depend in, the, in American culture, you can say that, but in Chinese culture, that's almost like taboo to talk about money like that. Again, that's a cultural issue. But what I'm really getting at is, Whatever you're doing now is a, your life mission, right? That's what I'm really getting at. What, I, what I'm really getting at is what have you learned from your past relationships? People say, don't talk about past relationships on the first date. I'm like, no, talk. Depends how you bring it up, right? If you're talking about like, oh, I hate my ex-girlfriend. Yeah, that's bad. But if you're talking about like, these are the lessons I learned and here's where I am. I don't want to know that. I would, most people want to know that about their partner. So how do you get to a point of a real conversation? And then that's the first date. But even in the approach, you know, hey, how are you? How are you doing? Da, da, da. It's like, no, there are different techniques you can use. Like, hey, I'm sorry you've been waiting for me. I know you're waiting. you look like you're waiting for a blind date. Sorry I'm late. And she's like, huh? That's role-playing, right? She's standing there sitting by herself reading a book. So there's so many ways you can change up that interaction to make it more interesting rather than, hey, how are you? You're beautiful. What's your name? You know, every guy is saying that. And they're better looking guys than you saying that. So what do you have to offer that's different? So there's a skill to this. There's a skill set to this. There's no skill cap. It's literally limitless, depending on how you want to express yourself. And if you can get there, then you'll realize that this game is limitless. Now, most guys get there by copying lines or saying things that they learn from other coaches. So what we call clones, right? Or they're like social robots. And sometimes that works. But if you can get there at a high skill cap by what I call optimizing for authenticity, so everything you're doing is like, how can I hit that attraction trigger or connection trigger, but I'm going to do it by being more authentic. Even your style, how do I dress more authentically that reflects my personality, but still creates that attraction, visual attraction spike. So now you optimize with skill cap and you're optimizing for authenticity as you're improving your skill. Then what happens is you hit this tipping point at this point where your game is very unique to your story. So now it's like nobody can compete with you, right? It's like, this is your story, okay? And now your game is so powerful and it's so congruent that people, girls don't test you anymore because they feel the congruency of it. You don't get flaked on. You don't get these like weird interactions where it's like, you don't know why you lost a girl, you know? Every part of the interaction is like, this is who I am, okay? And, and that skill cap is really strong. That's... In my opinion, the best way to learn game, and I think every 20-year-old guy should learn it so that they can express themselves fully, they can get to know themselves fully, and then they can get the girl that they want while learning more about themselves and how to express themselves. So for me, it's a win-win, you see. A common objection is, well, 
it takes too much time or you know maybe this is all BS. I'll give you an example for like a very extreme example. Let's take job interviews, right? It's like Giovanni, I I can't express myself the whole time because you know she'll think I'm too brutally honest or it's really embarrassing. I'm living with my parents, or whatever. So there's always the the issue of if I express myself, what if I'm not good enough? Okay. So let's take the job interview, right? So okay, I was interviewing at Google, and I had been rejected by Google 25 times, and on the 26th try, I got two interviews at two different departments at Google. So when I went in, I was like, I'm gonna get this job offer no matter what. So okay, I go in there and I use the social skills that I've learned on the side, and. At the interview, there's a manager. There's certain managers you can read their faces and the way they react to your questions, right? So in the beginning, I'm I'm very professional, and there's certain managers that just want to know that you can do the job. And in those cases, you don't want to like be friendly with them. You just want to say your accomplishments, and you want to look for openings where they kind of talk about their personal lives, right? But if they don't give you that opening, don't go there, because then you're breaking the rules of engagement. So how does that relate in dating? Well, hey, how's it going? You looked interesting and I wanted to meet you. You know, I'm living with my parents right now. They're diabetic. I'm taking care of them. But I just want to get out of the house and say hi. Yes, it's authentic, but you're breaking one of the rules of the rules of the game, which is you're lowering your social perceived social value and you're giving up too much information about health, about your parents. And it's not the right time to say that. You can tell her that maybe on the first date, right? And you can frame it in a way that's much better. Like, hey, I moved back home. I still have my great job, I'm really grateful, but my parents are getting older and I want to take care of them. That's a much better way to say that than I'm living with my parents and they have health problems, right? Um, okay, so back to the job interview, right? Sorry if I'm skipping too much, but I think it's, hopefully it's clear. So the job interview, you're talking to the manager that really just like, no BS, like, I want to know if you can do the job, right? Then I get to this guy named Jeff, and Jeff, the first question is, hey, he, his first question is, hey, so how's your job search going? Okay, I can tell just... From that alone, based on the gathering evidence, my working hypothesis is this guy's chill, right? So I'm like, oh, it's good. I still give a semi-professional answer. And then he's like, so like, then he starts talking about his experience. He's like, hey, this is what it's like to work at, you know, this division at Google. And he's very casual. And I'm like, this is the guy I want to befriend. So I open up a little bit more. I'm like, yeah, you know, honest, I, I got rejected a lot, but I wanted to get into Google and this might be my goal. And he was like, that's awesome. Like, that's tenacity. That's great. So, long story short, Jeff becomes one of my best friends at Google after I get the job offer, okay? And I, and I was able to do that because I followed the rules of engagement at the first interview, but also I was able to see if there were any openings within those rules to really express authenticity more fully, right? The problem is, I, the, the good thing I did was I didn't break that rule while I was talking to the other managers. Because had I did that for every manager, they would have been like, this guy, I don't care about your personal life. I want to know if you can do the job, Okay. How does that relate to dating? Why am I giving such extreme examples? Because the job interview is a very extreme example where you have to pretend to be very professional to get the result that you want, right? Especially at a company like Google, or any Fortune 500, really. In a dating situation, you have to gradually disclose authentic parts about yourself that do two things. One, let her get to know you, but more importantly than one is create attraction. Or how do you create attraction? By demonstrating value. So... For example, at some point in the conversation, you know, I have clients that, hey, you know, I, I live with my mom or my parents, what, what should I say? Um, at some point in the conversation, most of the guys would be like, yeah, where do you live? Oh, you know, I live around. No, no, seriously, where do you live? Oh, I live with my mom, right? Super low value, okay? But if you were to take control of that and say, hey, where do you live right now? Oh, that's awesome, you have your own apartment? I used to have one too, until I decided, right, taking control of the narrative, that my mom is getting older and she, she raised me and my brother and now I want to pay it forward, okay? I moved back home to take care of her. So, And actually, now that I'm with her, you know what I realized was that when I was little, I had an image of her, but now I'm really getting to know who she really is, you know? And I'm so grateful for the time we spent together. In my culture, when I was raised, and so different than American culture, we were t taught as kids to respect our elders because one day we'll get old too. And I kind of missed that and I, I finally understand what that means. Okay, how powerful is that narrative versus, yeah, I live with my mom. You know, look darting your eyes around. <laughs> so, okay, same concept, right? So at every point, my point is, learn to authentically express yourself at every point by obeying the rules of engagement of that game, whatever that social game is, okay? Because some people will judge you, they'll be hard on you, they'll test you. 
and you want to adhere to the rules of the game to win them over. But those people that are not playing by those rules, they'll give you signals, and then you can say, this person can be my friend, or I can have a deeper connection with this person, you see, or I can tell her more about myself earlier on in the dating process than I would some other girl to get the result that we both want, hopefully, right? So that's how I learned game, and no one else is teaching it that way, and it's not something that's like very like viral where I can just put 60 seconds, here's how you do it, right? And so my job before I retire is really to put this information out there and say, look, there's a way you can be more authentic and still create those attraction and connection triggers that get you the result for most guys of the girl that they really want. How do you do that? How did I do that over and over again? Here's the roadmap. Once I've done that and I feel like the information is out there in a way that's like educational but entertaining enough where enough people see it, then I think I'm going to retire because... In some ways, being a dating coach in your 40s, 50s, I feel like it's a little bit sad also. There's one more thing I wanted to ask you before we yeah. kind of wrap up, but you talked a little bit about dating models, and I know you've dated a few models and I've watched some of your videos. How How is it different than dating just a regular girl? So there's there's girls who look like models who are not in the modeling industry, and then there are girls who are in the modeling industry. So which one do you want to talk about? So probably the actual models. The actual models, about... Uh, to be honest with you, about 70 to 80, depending on the age range, but most model, young, female models are younger. Um, about 80 to, 70 to 80% of them, unfortunately, they, the, the temptation is too, just too strong to party because you, you're just the best looking girl in your town, right? Um, again, I was in a beer tier modeling city, but if you're in New York, maybe it's different. But they, they just get offered so many things, and as a young girl, you're just like drawn to it. So 80% of them have low attention spans. They don't tend to pay attention too much to in my opinion, serious things. And they're not the best girlfriends in general because they're just, there's too much temptation, uh, honestly. The other 20% of the models, I see, like for example, I go to a, a show and I'm waiting around, um, there's a lot of waiting around the modeling and I see their parents come with them or like I see them bring their brother. Like they're like very grounded. And those girl, other girls I want to date because they, they have a family social support system. Um, they have their parents telling them, like, you know, kind of guiding them along. They're just very grounded, and they're, sometimes they'll be, like, reading books instead of, like, strolling Instagram, right? Those are the models that I want, okay? Because the other models are just, like, kind of going through their, their phase, in my opinion. As you get older, though, I think girls, girl models that are, like, hitting 30, they tend to realize, like, okay, the smart ones, at least. They'll be like, okay, I, I know in this industry, I'm at my, almost at my peak, and I need to maximize my savings and I need to find a guy. This is, this is the point where I can have the most option to the highest value guys, right? And they start planning for that. And you can see how they're... Like, I have friends who are doing that. And I'm like, this is smart. This girl's smart. Because if I was a girl, I would do the same thing, right? Um, when you have that access to find a, a guy. So those are, that's the modeling scene, in my opinion. Now, obviously, there's always exceptions to the rule. But I would say, generally speaking, I don't necessarily like to date model models. I prefer girls who look like models yeah. that are not. Thank you so much for sharing. It's been really insightful to, to chat with you. So obviously, I'll leave a link in the description below for Giovanni's channel. So definitely go and check that out, especially if you're an Asian dude looking to, to work on your social skills and improve your date life. Go and check his channel out. But otherwise, I'll catch you guys in the next video. I'm on my own, broken along. I feel the rain crashing down. All around this empty town. I'm searching for the lost and found